Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar with Dr. Russ Fetterman. Russ Fetterman is a board-certified clinical psychologist in private practice in Charlottesville, Virginia. Dr. Fetterman specializes in providing psychotherapy to individuals with bipolarity. He had previously been employed as Director of Counseling and Psychological Services at University of Virginia. Dr. Fetterman is co-author of Facing Bipolar, The Young Adult's Guide to Dealing with Bipolar Disorder, New Harbinger. Since 2010, he has published the blog Bipolar U through Psychology Today. Welcome, Dr. Fetterman. It's a pleasure to have you. Thanks very much for the introduction, Aubrey. Um, okay, let's, let's jump right into the uh, discussion here. So from a clinician's perspective, the bipolar narcissistic combination is, is both challenging and fascinating. You know, sometimes it can be difficult to differentiate between the two diagnoses. Uh, one can be mistaken for the other and vice versa. And when both coexist in the same person, the treatment challenges can really be much more complex than if the person were coming in with just one or the other condition. Of course, from a patient's perspective, living with both isn't fascinating. It's more like it's having two different sets of forces in one psyche that recurrently create turmoil and emotional pain. So I, I really feel for those who either live with the bipolar narcissistic combination or are, are impacted by someone close to them who struggles with the same. So my, my intent today in, in this webinar is to describe each condition, to uh, talk about their similarities and differences, to highlight the challenges presented by their synergistic interaction, and to discuss treatment implications. Uh, as Aubrey has already, actually she, did, she didn't say it, uh, but we, we will have uh, approximately 15 minutes following the presentation for Q&A. So be sure to write down any questions that you may have as I go along. All right, so let me begin by talking about um, each of these two diagnoses as, as separate entities. Bipolar disorder is a biologically based brain disorder with recurrent patterns of mood variability where mood states transit between episodes of depressed mood and mood elevation. And I'll be elaborating on this substantially as I proceed further through the presentation. Bipolar disorder is not psychologically driven. It's not an organization of psychological defenses and corresponding symptoms or personality traits. It's not reflective of any psychological adaptation or response to developmental interpersonal influences. I sometimes think the visual image of a seesaw is a helpful metaphor in capturing the essence of bipolarity. You know, the person living with bipolarity typically experiences both sides or polarities of a mood continuum. Sometimes they're up and sometimes they're down. Depressed mood is something that most people can relate to. And I, and I don't mean to imply that most individuals have clinical depressive symptoms, but I'd say that most people from time to time do experience low mood, you know, feeling a bit blue. I mean, that's just how life goes. When we look at clinical depression or what we call major depression, we see that approximately 7% of US citizens have it. Uh, for those between the ages of 18 and 25, it's closer to 10% uh, or one out of 10. And in terms of lifetime prevalence or those having experienced major depression, major depression at least once in their life, we have a figure of 21% or approximately one in five. So yeah, depression is not at all uncommon. Now the slide you're looking at lists most of what people experience with major depression. Uh, my guess is that most of this is familiar to the listening audience. So, you know, in the interest of time, uh, I'm just going to pause here and have you look at this list without me necessarily addressing each of the separate items. Uh, but if you have any questions about these specific depressive symptoms, let me know during Q&A. Now with bipolar disorder, 
we typically see the presence of at least one major depressive episode with significant functional impairment for uh, about two weeks or more. Now, that doesn't mean that every time one is depressed, it lasts for two weeks. But we do look for a history where the individual reports at least one episode where depressive symptoms have hung on for two weeks or more, or have been serious enough to require hospitalization. Now, on the other side of the continuum, or the polarity uh, opposing depression, is mood elevation. Now, mood elevation, it's not simply the same as happy, though a positive mood is, is often present during mood elevation. But sometimes mood will also start out as positive, but after a period of time, it'll transition towards a more agitated mood state where someone feels keyed up, uh, on edge, tense, uh, unable to relax. I think it's more accurate to um, consider mood elevation as representing energized mood intensification right? Energized mood intensification. And why energized? Well, the opposite side of the polarity is energic or lacking in energy. Elevated mood represents that end of the continuum where energy is higher than normal for the individual. I want you to imagine mood as having a volume knob like you might see on a sound system amplifier. And elevated energy is what happens when that volume knob or the mood intensity knob becomes turned up above the normal listening range. Okay, so what does mood elevation look like? Um, I first, I want to be clear that there are, are symptoms described in writing, and then there are people who experience them. <laughs> That's a real important distinction. If we look at 20 different people who are all experiencing some aspects of bipolar mood elevation, you're going to see very 20 very different behavioral presentations. So rather than talking about specific symptoms, I want to look instead at different dimensions of mood elevation, kind of somewhat broader categories that may encompass a range of different mood and behavioral presentations. So the first two I've highlighted here because they're, they're just... <laughs> Uh, quintessential to mood elevation, and, and they are elevated physical energy and physical activation and lessened need for sleep accompanied by increased energy. Again, lessened need for sleep with increased energy, and I'll be coming back to these because they're, they're really important. We also see cognitive acceleration. The mind is moving faster, and because the mind is moving faster, speech typically is faster. Speech is sometimes uh, Pressured, meaning the person feels like they begin to talk and they can't stop talking until they get out everything that they have to say. Uh, we see increased goal-directed activity. Uh, someone may become hyper-focused on, on a specific goal or task where they're engaged in the pursuit of that endeavor, almost to the exclusion of everything else. Um, and that can certainly be maladaptive. Uh, we see uh, disinhibition, increased impulsivity. The areas of the brain responsible for uh, observing or thinking about the consequences of action, uh, utilizing judgment, they're overridden by the intensity of, of uh, other excitation occurring in the brain. Intensification of mood and emotions. And here I'll just have you think back on the volume knob I was talking about. Increased interpersonal engagement. When people are elevated, when they're hypomanic or, or manic, um, they're much more interpersonally active. They're extroverted. They're, they're, they're very engaged, very talkative, uh, and usually more so than they are during mid-range or, or, or during depressed phases. We see increased libido, increased sexuality, increased pleasure seeking. Amplification of positive perceptions of self. And I have this uh, highlighted here because it is really key to the subsequent discussion of narcissism that we're going to be having. So hold this one in mind. And last, uh, we have increasingly disorganized behavior as mood and energy intensify. What I'm meaning here is that as mood and energy intensify, or 
to say this differently, as there is increasing neural excitation occurring in the brain, the individual's capacity to keep it all organized and intentionally focused becomes compromised. So what we see is that as an individual's mood progresses from mid-range upward through normal positive mood, and then further upwards into hypomania and possibly full mania, and I'll get back to this distinction here in a minute, then behavior becomes increasingly disorganized and dysfunctional. Essentially, the further up one goes with mood intensification, the more they will appear to be out of control. And what I've done in this uh, slide here is I've tried to give you visual representation of what I just said. So we see increasing excitatory processes, uh, decreasing effectiveness of neural or brain network communication, and then increasing disorganized disorganization and decreasing effectiveness of functioning. All right, what I've tried to do with this busy slide, and it is busy, is to provide you with a visual overview of some of the different continuums that we have to consider within the bipolar spectrum. The mild blue line on top captures the range of different mood states. And if you take a look at them, you'll see what I mean. The line of different colored boxes below that represents degrees of impairment that accompany the mood states. The three different solid blue lines represent different diagnostic categories under the bipolar umbrella. Um, with bipolar one, we see individuals who do intermittently experience full manic episodes. With bipolar two, we have a similar depressive end as with bipolar one, but on the elevated end, individuals don't progress beyond hypomania, which again involves mild to moderate elevation. I'll also add that it's not uncommon that people with bipolar two spend more time in depression than do people with bipolar one, though that certainly doesn't hold true in all instances. And then there's also a variant we see where individuals experience recurrent mood variability, where they're cycling between episodes of depression and the upward end of normal good mood. In DSM-5, this is referred to as other specified bipolar disorder. I prefer to think of it as sub-threshold bipolar disorder. Uh, these folks do poorly on antidepressants and better on mood stabilizers, though because their mood elevation is not strong, it can often take many years before they find a professional who accurately identifies the overarching bipolar mood pattern. Now, the problem with a chart like this or any chart that tries to depict the continuum is that the ends of each category are fuzzy. They, they overlap, they bleed into one another. You know, there, there isn't an easily identifiable difference between the upper end of hypomania and the lower end of mania. Nor do we see a clear line between moderate and acute depression, right? But we do need different terms to be able to talk about different points on the continuum. So for now, we have to live with fuzzy distinctions. So narcissism, what is it? And before I go into the discussion, I want to express my strong conviction that the term narcissism has gotten a bad rap. In our society, the term carries a pejorative connotation. You know, when we hear someone referred to as a narcissist, it doesn't evoke positive thoughts or feelings. But the reality is that any particular personality style is not intentionally opted for. Like one doesn't wake up on any given day and say, I'm going to be narcissistic or I'm going to be borderline or, or even sociopathic. No, these are long held patterns of childhood adaptation that over time have become maladaptive. But the person living with their personality struggles doesn't have the option of stepping outside themselves. If I ask any of you to not be yourself today, you can't, at least not easily. So I really wanna be clear from the outset that when I'm referring to the narcissist, I'm not referring to anything bad that warrants negative judgment. 
I'm simply talking about an organization of personality dynamics that shapes how one relates to the world. All right, so what is narcissism? It's a style of personality adaptation where the young child learns to strengthen the attachment to self in response to limited emotional availability of the parent or caretaker. Now, when I refer here to limited availability, I'm not talking about a matter of time or how much the parent is there. No, it's, it's more a matter of the parents consistently not being empathically attuned to the emotional needs of the child. And when this is the case, the child doesn't get to feel emotionally seen or understood, which doesn't help the child develop a secure sense of self. With narcissistic development, it's not uncommon that the parent or the caretaking is, is, is relating to the child more in terms of the parent's own needs, as opposed to being attuned to the emotional need of the child. And this can reflect uh, egocentricity or a self-centeredness of the parent. But it can also simply be a matter of the parents being overwhelmed by environmental stresses, such as the mother who, you know, may be trying to care for four young children without adequate environmental support. So what does the young child do? He's got to figure out how to meet his own emotional needs at a point in time where he's not ready to do so. And I want to return here to my previous comment about attaching to the self. Essentially, the child figures out how to draw upon the developmental strengths and capacities that have already come into play and to inflate them in order to feel big enough. <laughs> Just kind of like the, the, the lost kitten who needs to become the tiger in order to deal with the challenges he's facing. By attaching to the self, and again, by inflating what's already there, the child figures out how to be bigger, stronger, more capable, and more emotionally self-sufficient than he actually feels, which, when you think about it, may actually be an adaptive choice at the time. Now, this is the essential aspect of narcissism. We're talking about the premature utilization of capabilities and self-sufficiency in order to minimize the experience of insufficiency. Narcissism takes its root during childhood development. The problem is that it continues as a predominant personality style into adulthood. It, it's a way of being where adequacy is inflated and employed towards limiting the experience of insufficiency. Now, as with most psychopathology, narcissism exists on a continuum. We see some people with mild narcissistic traits that, that are not maladaptive at all. Others can be somewhere in the middle, you know, uh, quite confident and impressive and probably not great at exposing their insecurities. And then on the upper end, we see people who are self-centered, boastful, strongly needing admiration from others while not being able to acknowledge any sense of inadequacy or insecurity. Now, just as with bipolar symptom acuity, the further up one goes on the narcissistic continuum, the more we see maladaptive aspects of personality. Let's face it, we, we, we all have combinations of strengths and vulnerabilities, right? Emotional health entails being able to live well with that balance. We get into trouble when we can only accept the positive end without also acknowledging the weaknesses or struggles that comprise our humanity. All right, so let's look now at, at kind of what we see within the typical mix of narcissistic personality characteristics. We have arrogance, a grandiose, a grandiose sense of self-importance, uh, constant striving or imagining of success, power, brilliance, beauty, love, or ideal love, uh, perceptions of self as unique and special, need to affiliate with others of high status in order to elevate or pull upwards one's own status. 
needs for admiration, uh, a sense of entitlement, right? The narcissist has difficulties with empathic connections with others. And I want you to think here of the comments I made about the, the parent-child dynamics where the child did not learn empathy because the child didn't receive sufficient empathy. The narcissist is also envious of others who have what is desired and seen as lacking within. Okay, so it's time now to shift a bit and to look at the intersection between bipolarity and narcissism. I want to reiterate that narcissism and bipolarity are two entirely different conditions but they can also coexist in the same person. Uh, with regard to incidence of comorbidity, it looks like it runs about 5% or said differently about one in every 20 people with bipolar disorder will also have narcissistic personality disorder. Now that said, there's probably a much higher percentage of people with bipolarity and mild narcissistic traits but they don't meet full criteria for narcissistic personality disorder, and thus they're not included in that 5% figure. So when you think of someone who presents with behaviors reflecting high energy, strong positive perceptions of self or even grandiosity, strong goal directedness, uh, gregariousness and interpersonal charm, you know, then, then we're faced with the legitimate question of how do we know what we're looking at? Is it bipolar mood elevation or is it narcissism? Well, one answer to this distinction, or one answer rather, is that this distinction can't be made just by looking at an individual's mood and behavior at any one point in time. Arriving at clear distinctions between the two diagnoses requires information about broad mood and behavioral patterns over extended periods of time. Okay, so what are some of the things that we look for to help us better understand these distinctions? First, bipolar mood elevation will be episodic, right? Elevations can span from several days to a few months. But the reality is that an elevation usually has an identifiable point of onset and a point where it resolves or comes to an end. Narcissism, on the other hand, will, will evidence some variability, but you know, overall, it'll tend to be more enduring over time since it's personality driven. If you see me at 20 different points in a year's time, you're probably gonna see 20 relatively similar versions of Russ. Again, personality has a more enduring quality than does bipolar mood. Also, when we look at the presence of elevated energy and less in need for sleep, which is earlier I said I'd be coming back to this, we only see this with bipolar mood elevation. I mean, truly, it just doesn't show up similarly in other diagnoses. I mean, certainly we may have someone who's not sleeping, you know, due to anxiety, or distress, or even excitement about something they're looking forward to. But that doesn't come without accompanying fatigue over the course of several days. So this specific variant of high energy and low need for sleep definitely speaks to bipolarity, but not to narcissism. Additionally, the acuity and duration of mood elevations will be stronger with bipolarity, particularly with bipolar one, where we do see occasional episodes of full mania, whereas mania is not a typical aspect of narcissistic personality. Bipolarity mood or bipolar mood is, is, is often influenced by seasonal patterns. With bipolarity, we see more mood elevation during spring and summer months, uh, largely due to increased light exposure, whereas we see more depression during late fall and winter. Now, that's not always the case with bipolarity, but I mean, we do see exceptions, certainly. 
My point though, is that you're not likely going to see narcissism strongly influenced by seasonal patterns, at least not in the way that we see bipolarity influenced by seasons. And last, narcissistically organized people will often have the childhood developmental background that I was discussing earlier in the presentation, whereas bipolar will not. It's genetic and biologically driven. So as you see, there's a whole range of different factors that help us identify differences between the two diagnoses. Okay, so for those who live with both, they're definitely faced with some unique dilemmas. Hypomanic mood often has people perceiving that their capabilities are enhanced. I mean, in fact, they very well may be. Cognitive capacity may be enhanced, the, the mind is moving faster, creativity may be increased, work productivity may be higher than usual. The individual may even find that they're more interpersonally effective and that others are drawn to their high energy. And this is where the problem lies. You see, this enhancement is really appealing to someone who is also narcissistic. And because of the appeal, it becomes more difficult for them to view elevation as something that's not good or something that should be avoided. So the bipolar narcissist will often have low motivation, at least early on in treatment, low motivation towards lessening their hypomanic intensity, which will interfere with their ability to easily get on board with treatment. I mean, why would they want to lessen something that feels so important to them? Additionally, if you think back to my earlier comments about defenses against adequacy, the depressive end of the bipolar continuum can be extremely difficult for the narcissist. They essentially feel like they're succumbing to emotions and perceptions of self that are intolerable and should be avoided at all costs. But unfortunately, the bipolar narcissist can't truly avoid their intermittent depression. If they could, they wouldn't have bipolar disorder. So they're stuck with something that repeatedly drops them into unwanted perceptions of self that they're trying to escape from. Okay, so kind of coming into the last part of the presentation here. Let's look at the treatment approach when, when both coexist. Most aspects of treating bipolarity um, in the narcissist will be the same as if it existed on its own without accompanying narcissism. So everything that you've heard about with regard to things such as uh, psychoeducation, medication, psychotherapy, and lifestyle management, they will all be the same when treating someone with comorbid bipolarity and narcissism. The important difference here lies in the approach to the narcissism itself. You see, early on in treatment, strong focus will need to be given to identifying and understanding the narcissistic dynamics through close examination of someone's developmental history. Essentially, the person needs to come to understand what unmet needs and what emotional pain had to be denied during childhood. Once they can get that, uh, once they can begin to feel that, then they need to be able to understand how those same defenses against vulnerability are still in play in their contemporary world, which is no small feat. I mean, we're talking about many months of psychotherapy that will need to be devoted to working on these issues. Once the person has begun to develop more acceptance of their own insecurities, they can then begin to lessen their attachment to the hypomanic enhancement they rely upon as flight from depressive inadequacy. It's equally important that they begin to accept that recurrent mood elevation really does carry negative consequence. You see, one of the therapist's allies here is, is the reality that most bipolar mood elevations are followed by transition into depressed mood. And the narcissist really wants to avoid depression. If the narcissist can gradually come to recognize that lessening elevation will also lessen depression, 
then that's one more factor that can be used to help buttress their motivations towards change. But of course, you know, if you're living with bipolar disorder, then depression will still likely be a place you visit from time to time. With the, with the uh, bipolar narcissist, it's important for the therapist to be recurrently speaking of the biologic underpinnings of the individual's depression, as opposed to having the person buy into the perception that their depressive low self-esteem really is a reflection of their true self. When I hear those kinds of statements from the depressed person, particularly the narcissistically depressed person, I often go towards something like, that's your depression talking. It's not an accurate representation of your totality. It's also really important to help the depressed narcissist recognize that their depression is transient. The depressed episode will come to a close. They won't be stuck with their depressive pain in an unending way. And that's really important because often in the midst of depression, people lose sight of the reality that their depressive episodes will indeed remit. Now, I'm one of those who feel somewhat hopeful about treating narcissism, at least in relation to individuals who are strongly motivated towards growth and change. You're probably all familiar with the saying, uh, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. Well, the same holds true for the narcissist in relation to psychotherapy. The narcissist really has to truly want to be helped. And they're only gonna reach for the help if they're able to realize that their narcissism gets in their way. If they do seek help, we can't remove the bipolarity they struggle with. But where there's enough insight and desire for change, we may be able to help lessen the maladaptive aspects of how their narcissism plays out in relation to their bipolarity. The treatment process will be gradual. I mean, after all, you know, personality wasn't years, I mean, personality was years in the making. Change will be slow. But I really do believe that people can get better at living with the bipolar and narcissistic combination. So I've kind of wrapped up here and I, I'm, I'm finding that I actually got this, got through this presentation more rapidly than I had uh, during my trial run. So we've got more time for Q&A than I expected. Uh, but before we proceed into Q&A, um, I want to acknowledge the great work done by the International Bipolar Foundation. Uh, they're able to continue their good work mostly on the basis of grants and donations. So please keep them in mind as a worthy organization to support. Okay, so Aubrey, um, I'm kind of through with the formal part of the presentation. Let's uh, shift now and see what kind of questions or thoughts folks have in response right. to what I've said. Well, thank you so much. That was extremely informative. And I just wanna remind everybody that the Q&A portion is now open. We do have about 25 minutes actually. And um, I wanna remind you that the questions are being recorded and will be archived for future reference. So definitely ask them now. And we'll start with the first question, which is, could you speak to the effect on a person with a predisposition to bipolar who partners with or marries a person with narcissism? No. <laughs> <laughs> the reason I'm laughing is just thinking about someone who is bipolar and someone who's narcissistic really doesn't tell us anything about those two people. Because as I said earlier, people are you know, they're so complex. There's so much more than just symptoms. So uh, I really don't know. That would have to do with the two specific people involved. I don't think I can be much more um, concrete about that. All right. The next question is, my mother-in-law is bipolar. My husband, I think, is a narcissist. He checks many boxes on your list of narcissistic traits. My personality is out of a codependent people pleaser type. And after 30 years of marriage, I feel like a major doormat. I have started therapy myself. 
My husband refuses to think he has a problem. What can I work on in my therapy? You can work on getting better at expressing your own needs and acting on them. You know, your husband may not comply. He may not simply honor that. He may not be responsive to your needs, but that doesn't mean you've got to be the passive doormat. You can pursue that which is important to you. You can stand up and say what, 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 what you're truly thinking and feeling, even if at times it, it isn't responded to well by your husband. But you don't have to be re relegated to this role of just being the quiet one in, in, in the shadow of his big personality. You too can emerge and be present. Okay, let's go on to the next question. Okay, the next question is, where there is comorbidity, is it typical to see the narcissistic personality disorder before the bipolar disorder presents itself? Yes, as I said, um, um, narcissism is enduring. It, it, it begins early during development. You see it begin to take clearer shape and form in, in, in adolescence and early adulthood. Um, and so if, if we're talking about onset of bipolarity, you know, somewhere after that, those phases of development, then certainly narcissism will have preceded it. Narcissism doesn't just arrive on the scene at 25 or 30 or at any point in adulthood. It's been there uh, in a pre-existing way. The next question is, do you think narcissistic abuse can cause bipolar disorder? Well, I think that ongoing stress and ongoing life pain can activate bipolar potential that's, yet, that's not yet resulted in one being symptomatic. Uh, and, and I would say that holds kind of across the board in relation to life stresses. So do I think there's a, any more likelihood that that's gonna occur because you have uh, someone who's bipolar and they're interacting with someone who's narcissistic and the interaction is, is complicated and difficult? Well, no, but if we just look at how the effect that life stress affects the uh, progression of bipolarity, I'd say, yeah, it's certainly a possibility. Next question asks, if you think that lack of empathy could come from a father and not just the mother. Of course. When, I, when I'm talking about the parent, I, I really am talking about kind of the, the people that are key in the person's development and Let's not simply go to the assumption that it's always the maternal figure. You know, sometimes the father can have a deep, not sometimes, often the father will have a deep and profound impact on, on the developing child as well. So I don't, I don't want mothers to be getting a bad rap here, okay? The next question is, do you believe if caught early enough in perhaps the teen years, narcissism can be reversed? Uh, that's a great question. I, I, I was thinking about this just yesterday or the day before, because I, I almost anticipated that could be a, a question. My answer is, is complex. And that is, you know, I, I, I worked for 22, 23 years in, in university mental health. And when I would see someone at 19 or 20 who was basically narcissistic, they usually didn't have the kind of self-observing awareness to see it and come to terms with it. Uh, they didn't yet have the maturity to recognize how it was problematic, nor did they have the life experience to see that their narcissism created recurrent difficulties for them in, in their life. Um, and so I found that in my work with young adults, I, I would, I could help them to look at it and talk about it, but I often didn't see much shift or change in personality dynamics during, you know, the 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 young adult years, uh, or the or the late adolescent years. Now, you just add five, seven, nine more years of maturation to that, 
and you see someone coming in and they're 27, 28, 29, they, they've kind of, they're out of school, they've gotten their feet on the ground a bit and they're kind of engaged in life in a very different way than they were when they were 19. And that's when I begin to see the, the potential for shift. Um, but the truth is, many of the people I see in therapy who, who are seeking help because of their narcissistic issues, they're often coming in somewhere in midlife. It's as if there's, there's got to be this accumulation of damage, accumulation of kind of negative consequence from their narcissistic style that finally begins to impact them. And they say, this isn't working, but that takes time. And so that's why I, I, I say that I don't often see those shifts occurring during the late teens. Um, now, it doesn't mean you're not going to have the exceptional late teen who really comes in, they, they, they recognize that they've got some problems in terms of personality style, and they're, they're seriously saying, how do I begin to shift who I am and how I am? And, you know, if I see someone like that, I'm going to say, come on in and have a seat and let's talk a whole lot more. So, yeah, certainly it's possible. It's just not common. Okay, the next question is, can you speak at all on whether there is a biological component to narcissism? Um, I can't say much. What I, what I can say is that um, temperament and disposition have some hereditary factors. Um, and so if you've got a parent or parents who are strongly narcissistic, then you're more likely to be inclined in that direction. Now, of course, the question here is, uh, are you inclined in that direction because uh, you're genetically loaded or are you inclined in that direction because you've grown up in that environment and that's what you've learned in terms of uh, observing your role models? Uh, so that's really hard for me to parse and be very specific about. But I, I, I would say that, that most strains of temperament do have a, a genetic basis as well as uh, social learning and, and, and being, being affected by developmental influences. The next question we have is, does nurture the child, nurture the inner child, I'm sorry, does the nurture the inner child approach therapy help the narcissist or does it avoid the issues? Well, I guess that depends on what is meant by that phrase. I mean, certainly I, I see that phrase out there. Uh, I'm not sure I'm very knowledgeable about precisely what it means. Um, but going back to my discussion earlier in the presentation, I think it's essential that the individual who is struggling with their narcissism recognize um, what, uh, how are they trying to adapt or, or manage or, or, or protect against particular sets of feelings that had to be uh, denied or minimized during childhood? And the more they can begin to open to and accept those feelings as part of their reality, then the less they're going to be driven towards defenses that help them to distance from those painful feelings. So I think that's really the key thing that you have to keep in mind. Okay, the next question is, if a person who has bipolar one takes on responsibilities early on in their life, more so than an average child, but is resilient and becomes independent, but experiences acute depression and suicidality, feeling inadequate and not good enough, does that necessarily mean they have narcissistic comorbidity? No, no, it doesn't. Because uh, if you think of what you just described, um, we might say that the depression that, that they're struggling with uh, certainly is, uh, is part of their bipolarity. I mean, anyone Anyone with bipolarity at times is going to be, be depressed and they're going to struggle with feelings of inadequacy and insufficiency. That's just part and parcel of depression. Uh, that in and of itself doesn't 
represent narcissism. And there are many folks who have to saddle or, or manage uh, challenges and responsibilities that, that kind of arrive earlier than they would be developmentally ready for. But that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to they're, they're gonna evolve in a narcissistic way. They may, but they may not. And, and I think some of that has to do with how early uh, during development do we see the premature uh, uh, ch challenges that are there in a way that the child has a hard time managing. You know, if, 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 this, is, if this is the case uh, in years between, let's say, age two, three, four, five, six, then that period of time is indeed going to contribute towards narcissistic development. But if you see those uh, challenges and difficulties occurring um, in, in early or even later adolescence, uh, then unless the narcissism has already begin to, begun to take shape, then you're not going to likely see it occur as a result. In cases I, I, I of... I, I, and I want to say to, to whoever wrote that question, I, I hope what I just said was clear. If, if you want some follow-up discussion, feel free to write me. Okay, great. Yeah. The next question is in cases of comorbidity, is the person at higher risk of not seeking treatment? Yes. And, and for the reasons I mentioned earlier, um, the, for, the, for the individual who has a narcissistic organization or narcissistic personality, their hypomania feels like it's a very important and essential part of who they are. Uh, it's, it, it's that synergistic interaction between the narcissism and the bipolarity. And so rather than seeking to help level them out, uh, they're actually gonna be more motivated to try to see how can they uh, perpetuate their hypomania or how can they kind of um, evoke it again and again because it's a, it's a mood state that feels very important to them. Um, and, and they're also, if, if their narcissism is well established, um, they're not going to be comfortable going into therapy and talking about their vulnerabilities, uh, their, their, their sense of inadequacy, their insecurities, their fears, that, that they're just not. I mean, many people are uncomfortable talking about that in therapy, but you take someone who has a strong narcissistic organization and it's, it's only going to escalate that resistance. So yeah, um, the bipolarity is, I mean, the, the, the comorbidity is particularly challenging because it often uh, interferes with people being able to uh, seek treatment uh, early enough. Do you have any tips as a loved one with a narcissistic um, person in their lives on how to address them and, and convince them to seek treatment? Again, without knowing more about the specifics of your connection with your loved one, it's hard for me to be concrete. Um, I think if you address them with loving, kind words and let them know that you're concerned, and you're concerned because you see them perpetually trying to avoid uh, feelings of um, vulnerability, uh, the ways in which they maybe don't feel like they're enough and that you see that creating problems for them. But you also have to humanize that. You have to say, look, we all have those feelings. I do, you do, just about everyone does. We, we, we live with combinations of many different feelings, some of which are, are, are inadequate and vulnerable. And to convey to them that you simply want them to be able to better own that and that you'll do everything you can to help support them towards that end. All right, it looks like there's one more question. If one sibling has bipolar and the other has narcissistic personality disorder, 
Do you have any tips to help them have a relationship that can function in a positive way? Again, I have to say without, without knowing more specifics, my answer is no, because uh, diagnostic uh, categories, uh, they just don't tell me enough about the individuals. And so if I were gonna really advise you, I'd need to have a little bit more texture about each of you and, and, your, and your differences and what needs to be addressed. So I don't think I can be more specific about that one. Okay, so I guess we'll we're, we're through, Aubrey? Yes, we had a lot of questions. It was a great talk. So I wanna thank you for sharing your expertise with us today. And if anybody has follow-up questions, I am happy to forward them to Dr. Fetterman. And we right. hope and, to... and if oh, right. and I'll say if, if 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 folks have questions about my work or my practice uh, in the opening slide, you'll see my website. There's a lot of information there about me and the work I do. And so you can go there to get m more information. OK, and we have a lot of thank yous in the comment section. So thank you once again, and we hope to see you again soon. All right, and you're welcome all. So thank you for your thanks. All right, bye-bye now. Okay.